Hello everyone, welcome to our Morton's on the Move channel. I'm Tom, and in today's video, I'm gonna be doing a detailed walkthrough of an electrical system that we helped install on Kyle and Olivia of Drivin' and Vibin's 1979 Airstream Argosy that they've been renovating. My wife and I recently got to spend some time with Kyle and Olivia helping out with their Airstream Argosy renovation project. While we helped on many aspects of the installation, one of the things they specifically asked us to help on was the electrical system design and installation. They had already sourced some of the major equipment, so we helped finish the design and implement it. The design criteria was to build the system as robust as possible for being plugged in or an off-grid, middle-of-nowhere situation. We designed the system within limitations of cost and the RV, being weight, space, and size. As much of the design was done upfront as possible, as the installation began when the walls were apart so we could run wires. Most of the electrical system was completed about halfway through the build, which was great because then we could utilize the system to finish construction. In this video, we're gonna be covering the main components of the system and how they integrate together. RVs always have an AC side of the system, which run the large power consuming electronics like your air conditioners and general receptacles that are similar to what you'd find in a home, and the DC side of the system, which is low voltage and contains the battery and DC electronics that don't need the AC to operate and are on all the time. We'll talk about these two systems in this RV. Throughout this video, I'm gonna be referencing a schematic that I drew up of this system. A high resolution version of this schematic will be available over on our website on the accompanying blog post that you're welcome to download and follow along if you wish. So let's get into it. So let's start out by taking a look at the schematic. In the schematic, blue wires represent 120 volt AC power. In real life, they are black and white, but that's hard to represent on a drawing. Black and red wires are DC power wires, and in this RV are all 12 volts, with the exception of the solar panels that come in at a slightly higher voltage. Dashed purple wires represent communication cables that are sending data from one device to another. Let's start out by taking a look at the batteries we selected for this install. Five 100 amp hour Battleborne lithium batteries were selected and wired in parallel at 12 volts to provide 500 usable amp hours or 6.8 usable kilowatt hours of battery power. As part of the system design to make this system as off-grid capable as possible within the limitations of the RV, lithium batteries were the best choice to get as much power in the smallest space possible. Because lithium batteries have no off-gassing, it was decided to install the batteries inside the coach under a seating area. Keeping the batteries inside was important for these batteries because they will not accept a charge below freezing. The batteries were wired in parallel using paralleled one aught cables to provide the correct impacity. We only did this because we had lots of one aught cable available to us and paralleling them is an acceptable way to increase the impacity. Alternatively, we could have used one four aught cable. After paralleling all the batteries together, the positive lead first passes through the main battery disconnect, then on to the 350 amp ANL fuse. We located this disconnect and fuse as close to the batteries as possible in the battery compartment. Off the negative lead of the batteries, we first pass through a 500 amp rated shunt. The shunt measures all of the current going into and out of the batteries along with the voltage to provide a very accurate state of charge and usage reading from the batteries. The shunt has a dedicated voltage sense wire that connects to the positive terminals of the batteries. A data cable sends information about the current and voltage of the batteries to a dedicated monitor, in this case the BMV712 unit, that is installed remotely where it can be viewed. This unit provides information such as power into and out of the batteries, how many amp hours have been consumed, the state of charge of the batteries, what the estimated runtime is, the voltage of the batteries, and the current, positive or negative. This unit also has a built-in relay that can be triggered upon different battery conditions and is a really great tool to add advanced functionality to a system. After the shunt and fuse, the cables pass into an adjacent electrical compartment. This compartment houses our main electronics and is actually the bottom of a closet and will have a cover over it once it's complete. At the front of the cabinet, we recessed and mounted all of the equipment that needs to be accessible. This includes the breaker panel, battery monitor, inverter enable, and transfer switch. The main battery cables enter this compartment and immediately land on a set of 250 amp bus bars. 
These bus bars are in place to distribute the power from the batteries to all the devices that need to connect to them. Bus bars help to keep installs clean, organized, and distribute power most efficiently. After passing through the bus bars, we connected to the largest piece of equipment on the system, the inverter charger. In this case, we used a Victron MultiPlus 3000 volt amp 120 amp charger inverter combination unit. This device converts the 12 volts DC from the batteries to 120 volts AC for the RV's general receptacles. This device also acts as the main battery charger and can take power from the grid or a generator and charge the batteries at up to 120 amps. We'll talk about the 120 volt side of the inverter soon, but let's finish up going over the DC side of the system first. Let's step back to the bus bars and see how all the DC equipment in the RV is connected. In this RV, we used a Progressive Dynamics PD4000L Lithium Power Center control unit to distribute the DC and AC power in the rig. The Progressive Dynamic unit came with power leads that were designed to connect to the battery, pass through a fuse panel, and then out to all of the equipment in the RV. These leads were pre-installed in the Progressive Dynamic unit, so we connected the positive leads directly to the positive bus bar. Power then passed through the fuse panel, and we connected all of the RV's DC equipment to the leads that were labeled on the back of the unit. Basically all of the DC equipment in the RV passes through this panel. That includes things like the water pump, lights, jacks, water heater electronics, and any other DC powered equipment in the RV. The Progressive Dynamic Unit did not have a negative bus bar, so we added a simple additional ground bus that we brought all of the negative leads in the RV back to. This ground bus was just a second bus bar that we brought off of the main bus bar so that all the power could flow back to the battery. At the ground bus, we also connected it to the RV frame. Most of the electrical wires were installed in the walls during the renovation. They were pulled back to the location where the electrical cabinet would eventually be and labeled. This required a lot of forethought and planning, but wiring the system up went well. While the MultiPlus is the primary charger for this system, the Progressive Dynamics unit does have a battery charger built into it. In this system, the Progressive Dynamics battery charger is strictly a backup in case the inverter ever failed. This was part of the design of the system to provide redundancy and make it as robust as possible. From the DC fuse panel, we also connected the auxiliary power from the truck that can power the DC system when the truck is plugged into the RV. Before reaching the trailer's pigtail, however, we passed through a BGA-225 battery guard unit. This unit is designed to automatically disconnect the RV's battery system if the voltage gets too low. This unit was also recommended by Battleborn as it can provide potential surge suppression from the vehicle's electrical system. Vehicles have the potential to create high voltage flyback transients from the alternator if it's rapidly disconnected. I'm not sure how big of an issue this is, however, because most modern vehicles have good snubber diodes in the rectifier to prevent these transients. Now that we've taken a look at the DC distribution side, let's take a look at the solar charging system for this RV. Starting up on the roof, we installed four 115-watt ZAMP panels and two 90-watt ZAMP panels. The 90-watt ZAMP panels were long and skinny and fit alongside the air conditioner even on the extremely curved roof of this RV. ZAMP panels all have very similar voltage characteristics which makes them ideal to be paralleled together. If you're using dissimilar sized panels like this, it's a good idea to do the calculations to figure out what series parallel configurations will be most efficient for your system. The ZAMP panel Panels are intended to be installed as a kit and have inline fuses built into each panel. The panels came with a rooftop penetration connection unit that parallels all the panels together. We already had an existing roof penetration, so we actually installed these rooftop units inside but still plugged the panels directly into them. We connected all six panels by paralleling two of these rooftop penetration units together. We first passed all the power through a 65 amp breaker disconnect that will allow us to disconnect the solar panels from the charge controller and provide overcurrent protection if it were ever to occur. Because all the panels are in parallel and the voltage of the panels is pretty low, the overall voltage coming off the roof is only around 15 to 20 volts. Nonetheless, this is slightly higher than the voltage of our batteries and the current will be slightly lower, so we kept the charge controller as close to the bus bars as possible and ran the leads from the ZAMP combiner box down to our charge controller located in our electrical compartment. We chose to use a Victron 100 volt 50 amp MPPT charge controller. This charge controller can accept voltages of panels up to 100 volts and provide 50 amps of power to the batteries. The charge controller is a maximum power point tracking unit 
and can triangulate between multiple power points to maximize solar generation even under partial shading conditions. After the solar charge controller, the power is passed through a 60 amp ANL fuse and then lands on the two bus bars that will charge the batteries. The system has four battery chargers, the solar charger, the charge from the truck, the Victron Multi Plus, which charges from 120 volts AC, and the backup charger, which always is to remain off unless the Multi Plus is bypassed. In an off-grid application, both these 120 volt chargers will be powered from a generator that Kyle and Olivia carry. That concludes the DC side of the system for this RV. Let's now go over the AC side of the power system. Let's start by taking a look at how power enters the RV from the main power cord. This RV is a 30 amp RV, which means it only has one hot and neutral, as opposed to a 50 amp, which has two hots and a neutral, and operates at 240 volts between the hots. This makes wiring in the inverter to the entire RV much easier. The RV's power cord enters up through the floor and immediately enters into the transfer switch box. This transfer switch allows you to select the inverter power or bypass it completely and connect directly to the shore or generator. The transfer switch adds a failsafe to the system, allowing you to bypass the inverter if it were ever to fail. Power does jumper off before the transfer switch to the inverter and passes through a 30 amp breaker. This power allows the charger portion of the inverter to charge the batteries and also can bypass power through the inverter. This inverter is also special because it's a hybrid inverter and it can combine shore power and battery power to provide a greater power output. This is particularly useful because you can set a limit on the power input to the inverter. If you're plugged into a 20 amp or 15 amp receptacle, you can set that limit and you won't pop the breaker that you're plugged into. This also will allow Kyle and Olivia to use their smaller Honda generator and combine power from the solar and batteries to run larger appliances like the air conditioning and cooktops. After power returns from the inverter and goes through the transfer switch, it passes on to the Progressive Dynamics AC distribution box. This was a small power distribution box with only four breaker slots. Wiring quickly became a challenge in the small space, but we were able to wire all the AC appliances, like the air conditioning, water heater, and general receptacles throughout the RV. We used two tandem breakers to double the circuits and one GFCI for the kitchen, bath, and outdoor receptacles. The MultiPlus inverter also acts as a UPS, or uninterruptible power supply. If the shore power is lost, it will seamlessly switch to the batteries and you may not even realize that you lost the power. The last piece to this system is the data display. While all of the Victron components that we installed can operate on their own, they can also communicate together to display all of the information in one place and even work together to do different things. Data cables run from the BMV712, the MultiPlus inverter, and the MPPT charge controller to the Victron Color Control GX. This unit aggregates all the information and can show you things like power flow in and out of your batteries from the grid or the solar. Here's a circumstance where the inverter is running and the power is coming from the batteries and the solar. Here the system is connected to the grid. The inverter is charging the batteries and passing power to the AC loads. Here's the inverter in its hybrid mode where it's assisting the shore power by adding power from the batteries and solar. We have the current limit turned way down to draw minimal power from the grid. This display unit can also be used to change the input current limit from the shore power. Setting this current limit will also limit the inverter's battery charging power. The inverter prioritizes AC loads in the RV and uses whatever power is left over to charge the batteries. This display unit can also connect to the internet so you can check the system status anywhere in the world. Well that's about it for the electrical system. At the time this video was shot, the RV was still under construction, but the electrical system was pretty much complete. It was actually great to have the electrical system functional while we were working, including that hybrid inverter, because we were limited on AC receptacles, and we were able to use the batteries and the inverter to run our equipment, even large vacuums and air compressors. The only project left to be completed was to add an additional fan to help circulate air in the electrical compartment. The inverter, solar charge controller, and even wires can get warm in that cabinet, and they need to be kept cool for longevity. Overall, we're pretty happy with how this system turned out. It's pretty cool to see all those modern electronics in a 1979 Airstream shell. It's amazing what we can accomplish today with power systems compared to what was available in 1979. 1979 was actually the year the first viable inverter became available. Inverters, batteries, and small power systems like this have come a long way since then, and it's amazing how easy it is to be comfortable off-grid these days. We're super excited to see Kyle and Olivia testing the system out in some beautiful location in the 
the middle of nowhere. If you want to see more about the Airstream Argosy renovation, definitely check out Drivin' and Vibin's YouTube channel. They've got tons of great content following the whole renovation process. Well, I hope you've enjoyed following along with this electrical installation. And if this video has earned your subscription, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.